let's continue. Our next speaker, um, Jin Yeo. Um, he's supposed to be here, but he has some health, um, uh, he has some health concerns, so he will present his work remotely. Hi, Jin. Um, can, can, you hear, so, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Okay. So Jin is the, uh, Jin Yeo is the professor of cell, cellular molecular medicine at, uh, uh, at USFD, serving as the director of the USFD Center for RNA Technology and Therapeutics. A uh, chief scientific advisor for Sanfer Laboratory for in uh, Innovative Medicine and founding member of the Institute for Genomic Medicine. His pioneering research focuses on RNA processing regulation and the role of RNA binding protein in developmental processes and diseases. Dr. Yu has over 250 peer reviewed publications, including impactful contributions to a neurodegeneration. Computa computational biology and stem cells models. Dr. Yu's impact intends to tends to therapeutics with significant contribution to RNA binding therapy for neurologic disorders and cancer. And he has developed stem cell based models for disorders such as myotonic dystrophy, Huntington's disease, LS, and FTD. So, Jing, the stage is yours now. Okay, great. Anyway, thanks for the introduction. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I got a, a bad bug on the way back from uh, UPenn. Um, <clears throat> so today, what I thought I'll do is, is it's going to be hard to follow uh, uh, Don's amazing talk, but I'm going to try to be a bit somewhat controversial since the, the workshop is, is really about uh, uh, IPS-derived models for, for disease correction. And uh, uh, and so here here's, the, here's how I want to Think about this, right? So, but but just a bit of intro. <clears throat> so, my lab works on uh, primarily you know, RNA biology, and just to remind everybody, including um, um, uh, uh, folks that don't think about RNA biology, uh, that uh, RNA is never naked. Uh, this is work from one of my students who draws for the New Yorker, uh, where the RNA molecule there is always uh, chaperoned by RNA binding proteins, including the RNA binding protein TDB forty three. And so we are very intrigued about um, RNA biology as the basis of or this regulation as the basis for many diseases. And so in my group, we really study how proteins affect RNA regulation and how the dysregulation of RNA binding proteins um, uh, give rise to human diseases, right? But we spent quite a bit of time developing genomic technologies um, and also disease modeling, uh, leveraging IPS technologies and other technologies to uh, uh, give rise to the novel therapeutic paradigms. Um, so what I thought I'll do though is, uh, uh, since I knew I was following on Don's talk, right, is to um, talk about how we've been modeling um, um, ALS um, and using IPS lines, and then how we are thinking maybe that's one way of doing that, but there might be other ways of modeling the disease. And so as Don already mentioned, uh, the majority of ALS patients have cytoplasmic, right, inclusions of this RNA binding protein, TDP43. Normally, TDP43 is in the nucleus uh, of, of healthy neurons, is the idea, and that it mislocalizes uh, over time uh, uh, in the conditions, uh, in, in ALS um, um, backgrounds, right, or sporadic ALS, right, as well. And so we've been very interested in, in, in uh, thinking about how we model the disease. And of course, Don had already mentioned his work and, and Kevin Egan's work showing that um, that that when nuclear TDP43 uh, uh, mislocalizes to the cytoplasm, uh, you have the loss of TDP43 in the, in the nucleus from its nuclear binding targets, uh, and that uh, leads to derepression uh, of uh, cryptic exon statin two, right? And so this this will we'll come back to this as a, I think a good marker for uh, loss of nuclear TDP forty three. Of course, there are, there are now many other um, exons that depend on TDP forty three, uh, including many uh, non cryptic exons, and so that makes as Don may have not pointed out, but that makes targeting knocking down TDP forty three a terrible therapeutic strategy. Um, and so, uh, so therefore, other strategies like Stefan two correction is uh, a viable one. And so, in in our group, we've been very interested in understanding the interplay between the environment, uh, stress, you know, genetics, and aging. And so, in the past, um, uh, we've been for more than a decade now leveraging IPS derived motor neurons 
right, um, to study ALS, right? And so the unperturbed, non-modified uh, um, uh, uh, form of uh, uh, IPS-derived motor neurons that only have nuclear uh, uh, levels of TDP43. And so that's sort of uh, um, uh, true for wild type, but also true for the ALS, you know, TDP43 mutant or sporadic ALS samples. And so we've been thinking about how do you then model what you, you know, you hopefully see in patients, right, with different factors. So I'll talk about two factors today. One is the environmental uh, factors and the other one is aging. And so, um, so the first one is, you know, can we add environmental factors to IPS-derived motor neurons to try to mimic some of the features of ALS-dependent um, cellular uh, perturbations, right? And so one of these uh, uh, environmental stimuli is very simple. You, you stress the cells, right? And so one way of stressing cells is to use uh, reagents that affect translation, uh, mRNA translation, uh, or ER stress, or uh, um, uh, affect the integrated, integrated stress response, right? And so uh, the consequence of many of these stressors at the end uh, these is uh, ERF2 alpha phosphorylation def uh, change. And, and that change leads to the formation of these uh, protein RNA uh, aggregates in the cell. And, and there are many protein RNA aggregates. There are ones which are GGBP1, which is another RBP dependent. And there are ones which are also TDB43 dependent. And there are other ones which are you know, re related to many other RNA binding proteins. So this is, a, this is a cartoon from Roy Parker's lab showing that if you stress cells with arsenide, you form these puncta in the cytoplasm. There are GGBP1 positive, normally it's diffuse, but when you stress the cells, they react by aggregating these things. And this is a dynamic reversible process. And you do see uh, that mutations uh, in many genes can lead to increase or decreases of clearance of these uh, different RNA granules. And so uh, we propose a model where, where, where these granules may be a useful system where we can study the effect of environmental insults to IPS neurons. Normally, we expect that this protein RNA aggregates will be transient and dissipate over time in a wild type condition. But in ALS mutations, as we know, uh, that, that may lead to aberrant aggregation. And, and some of them are GTBP1 dependent and some are not. And so, again, just to remind everybody, including TB43, many other RNA binding proteins are mutated in various forms of ALS. And many of these mutations occur in the intrinsically disordered regions of the protein in green that changes the stickiness of the protein to itself or to other RNA binding proteins. Um, and so a couple of years ago, uh, Sebastian Mark Miller and my group um, tried to leverage IPS mononeurons uh, and stress conditions to see whether we can recapitulate disease-relevant phenotypes, right? So again, if you take a, a wild type and an ALS IPS derived motor neuron, uh, you don't really see differences. TDB43 is in the nucleus, um, and you don't you know, see the loss of uh, statin 2 uh, gene, a protein, and all these other features, right? Which makes sense because ALS is a, uh, because IPS lines are a good model for embryonic development, um, but patients, like, you know, kids don't get ALS um, when, they, you know, when they're, when they're young, they, they get to a certain age, and then they get ALS, right? So. So the stress conditions here, uh, a low dose pyromycin stress, which is translational stress, seem to lead to. Um, sorry, is there is there an issue uh, with the uh, with the sound on the slides? Or, or okay. Not good. Okay, go ahead. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so pyromycin stress uh, leads to uh, TDB forty three to accumulate in the cytoplasm when when it's uh, treated in the cell over time. Um, and also uh, the prolonged stress leads to uh, altered TDB43 binding to the statement to uh, cryptic exon, right? Because TDB43 is in the cytoplasm. Uh, it leads to a, a, a lack of recovery of RNA localization across you know, many thousands of RNAs in the cell. Uh, and when you add stresses to uh, ALS lines, you get exacerbated cell death, uh, but the same stress added to a wild type line, healthy line, uh, you get some cell death, but it's uh, definitely not um, in the same degree, right? So uh, we think that it amplifies the genetic uh, vulnerabilities is amplified by the stressor to lead to delayed onset, onset cell death, but in an increased manner. <clears throat> and so, so then we got very interested in, in saying, well, since this paradigm is helpful in, 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 in modeling the disease, 
perhaps we can try to identify other targets uh, around these uh, granules um, that may stabilize or change uh, the RNA metabolism of the cell uh, as, as, as novel ways to modify disease, right? And so to begin to do that, uh, the first, again, very basic experiment is what, what, what is in these RNA granules upon stress? And so what Sebastian did was use APEX labeling, which is a proximal labeling protocol, where you treat cells uh, with hydrogen peroxide and biotin phenol. And in the cell, you have a knock-in line um, uh, with you know, using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock in the, the uh, APEX2 enzyme, which is a proximal labeler. And in the presence of the hydrogen peroxide, uh, you get activated biotin phenol that activates about a one to 10 nanometer radius around uh, the protein that you've tagged. So in this case, GGBP1, this is a stress granule protein. Um, and others have now done this in other labs with TDB43 and FUS and other um, ALS-related monolithic proteins. And what we can see here is that you get labeling all the proteins in close proximity. That means that the proteins doesn't have to be directly bound to the protein of interest to come down, right? As long as it's nearby. You don't have post lysis reassociation. You don't get proteins that falsely sediment by centrifugation, you, you um, recover these proteins using streptavidin uh, followed by mess spec. And so we found actually that we discovered the human compendium uh, of proteins uh, for the first time, right, in these RNA granules. And, and uh, we found that many of these protein uh, constituents are already pre-assembled on the mRNA uh, and are just amplified in its aggregation upon stress, which makes sense because ribosomes run off. And for the first time in the cytoplasm, the RNAs are more naked, <laughs> but then RBPs can bind and, and, and um, cover these, uh, these RNA molecules, right? So, so we found that many of these RNA binding proteins, we've discovered uh, that if you deplete some of these stress granule proteins, which are also RNA binding proteins, you can reduce this uh, formation of, of, uh, of uh, granules in, this, in the cell. And so uh, we've been trying to hold, you know, narrow down or filter down uh, uh, candidates, right, by this approach. So we took the list for about 300 genes, and we've been working with folks initially at Biogen, now at, at uh, Christy Wharton at Brown University, to uh, leverage uh, fly models to study how knockdown of some of these granule-associated proteins can recover um, uh, you know, ALS-relevant uh, neurodegenerative phenotypes, right? So I won't cover uh, some of that uh, that work that Christy and her um, uh, student, Anchi Zhao, has done, but we, uh, at the end, led to phenotypic rescue. That means if you knock down these four genes uh, in these fly models of ALS where you overexpress uh, TDB43 that has, mu that has mutated or other proteins, FUS or C9 uh, or 72 which is another ALS like the G4C2 repeat um, gene, uh, you seem to phenotypically rescue these um, uh, uh, these uh, neurodegenerative diseases, right? And just to point out, one of them we're very excited about because this one, when we knock down uh, O2D4, again, I won't go, don't have the time to go into what the gene is doing, but when you knock this gene down, uh, statin 2 levels go up, right? And and so uh, that is, we've discovered, uh, well, I'll show you the next few slides, uh, the mechanism behind that. Uh, to some extent. So, so as I showed you, if you knock down O2D4, uh, you have increases in statin 2. And is this coming from the protein level or the RNA level? And it turns out that if you that it is from uh de you know is from de uh, a proper repression, right? Uh, of the cryptic exon. So you here on the left you see uh, full length uh statin 2 mRNA. Uh, if you in these IPS derived uh, mononeurons uh um uh knock down uh, O2D4, you get uh, recovery of the full length. It's because you get a reduction in the truncated or the cryptic exon uh, form of statin 2. Um, and so one way, an artificial way, so this is a non-stressor way, but just to get around the, sometimes the arguments about your, you know, your stress the cell, right? Well, maybe another way to do this is you, you force TDB43 itself into the cytoplasm by expressing a lengthy virus carrying mutant uh, nuclear localization signal operating frame of TDB43. As you can see, that forces uh, uh, TDB43 in the cytoplasm. Um, and so that should get you a uh, loss of nuclear TDB43. And therefore you get a uh, uh, depression uh, of cryptic exon uh, there and then in segment two, and then you get a truncated form. 
um, in the context where you uh, do this uh, with mut uh, the mutant uh, NLS, uh, you see increases in the cryptic exon, right? Because uh, TB4 is forced in the cytoplasm. Um, and this is with just uh, a scrambled knockdowns. But with uh, O2D4 knockdown, you actually uh, 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 restore stem to splicing, <clears throat> even in the context of overexpressing or cytoplasmically local localized TB43. So uh, we're excited. There are a couple of different mechanisms that we're trying to explore. Maybe O2D4 plays a role in, in stabilizing uh, the aggregated form of TV43 in the cytoplasm, maybe depleting that, uh, recovers that. We have obviously another uh, uh, possible model is where it maybe directly controls splicing of statement two uh, by enhancing it. Uh, we actually see this for many, many TV43 targets. Uh, so maybe there's a more global role that O2D4 can rescue more TV43 targets uh, uh, than just statement two. Um, so this is a, one approach in trying to get to a novel therapeutic targets in neurodegeneration. Uh, uh, we are working with uh, Denali Therapeutics, uh, John uh, Rabbits at UCSD and Eric Bennett to develop uh, blood brain penetrant oligos for O2D4 that you can deliver in the blood to get into the brain um, uh, to uh, to hopefully have have uh, impact here. So this is this is uh, you know one way we're using IPS derived uh, mo mo uh, systems where we stress the cells to elicit disease phenotypes to get us to uh, novel targets, but the other way uh, is to say well maybe the IPS system isn't the right system to model age uh, dependent disease right, and so is there a way to add the aging component here? And Kevin Ryan, a postdoc in the lab, has been evaluating uh, a different strategy, and so the strategy here. Um, is to uh is to uh, uh leverage the idea that that we know that perhaps in aging you have many other RNA uh, biology defects that happen and so maybe the cells are much more poised to uh, uh um, synergize with genetic uh, mutations that therefore lead to neurodegeneration at a different at some age right and so he leveraged uh, the trans differentiation system so he took fibroblasts um from uh. Uh, patients, uh, wild type in this case for now, uh, also about ALS patients I don't have time to talk about. And you just transdifferentiate this fibroblast uh, directly into neurons, right? And uh, same for, uh, you obviously you can do the same, you, you reprogram, like I already talked about IPS lines, and then you, you, you know, normally differentiate these into IPS derived neurons. So let's call this an old, you know, in quotes, and a fetal, in quotes, uh, neuronal system. You get relevant, similar neuronal cell types, uh, electrophysiologically active ones. Um, and, and as a reminder, when you reprogram cells from, from fibroblasts, you wipe out the epigenetic uh, state of the, the genome, so the cells are now back to a, a um, say, an embryonic-like state, right? And so on the left, you see an epigenetic clock uh, from uh, bisulfide uh, or methylation analyses across the genome, and that's absolutely true. Uh, the iPS derived neurons are basically babies, right? But when you uh, transdifferentiate the neuron from fibroblasts, they retain the epigenetic marks, which is the age represented by the patient that has those fibroblasts, right? And indeed, these transdifferentiated neurons are already stressed, or they have markers of senescence, they have apoptotic markers different from the uh, iPS derived neurons. Uh, and just you know, for our interests, right? Uh, turns out that there's a global change in RNA metabolism, right? In the transdifferentiated neurons, you see that uh, the spisosome is uh, uh, very different, right? Uh, um, uh, using uh, uh, proteomics efforts. Uh, in fact, they're uh, much more um, enriched. Um, and uh, and then you see sort of differences in the, uh, uh, in the uh, sorry, down-regulated. Down and then you see uh, that many of these normally are higher in the iPS-derived uh, neurons from the transdifferentiated neurons. And TDB43, it's uh, uh, enriched in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus anymore, right? So this is quite exciting because we've had spent you know, a decade trying to see whether stressing iPS-derived neurons can get UTB43 in the cytoplasm. Here, um, we think that the epigenetic uh, landscape uh, of aging uh, gets UTB43 in the cytoplasm kind of for free, but including many of this of, of these lysosomal proteins, so these are RNA bind proteins, uh, 
Um, and so some, so basically RNA splicing and RNA poly, probably polynylation because polynylation is related to splicing as well. They're already messed up, right, in the transdimensional neurons. And we know that CB4V binds to GU-rich motif. These are things that, that we've done. We had looked at in mouse very early on in 2011, right, 2012, right? Um, we see that the motifs are not different between the transdimensional neurons for IPS derived neurons, but uh, the binding patterns are very different. So in the IPS derived uh, neurons, you see CDB43 in the nucleus, right? So you see a lot of binding in intronic regions here, here, for example, you can see this blow up here, beautifully, uh, completely covering agrin one. But in transdimensional neurons by clip analysis, you don't see these binding patterns anymore because now it's in the cytoplasm. So it's uh, pretty exciting to see that we can try to model this. We think this is not just in this funny transdifferentiated state. We've done many lines, uh, uh, but also in old mice. So in, in 24 month old mice, uh, you see TB43 and other splicing factors already in the cytoplasm, uh, but in young mice, it's in the nucleus. Um, I have other sort of phenotypes here um, that I, I might skip over. Uh, I'll skip over this one. Uh, but we think that a lot of the RNA granular components are already pre-aggregating. So that means in the older neurons and codes, uh, many of these proteins are already aggregating in the cytoplasm, uh, which may be why if you have a genetic variant uh, in TB43 or, or, or something else that doesn't clear TB43 from the cytoplasm, you get this acceleration um, that is age-dependent, right? Like this was the other factor we've been missing. Um, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to skip this one. So, so we think that 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 this uh, may be a different way to model age-driven RBP RNA binding protein mislocalization or misregulation, um, um, and you know you have chronic stress that you can add to an iPS-derived cell line uh, as a way to overcome it, or the epigenetic age itself is a kind of stressor already that um, that without any treatment in the cells you get this uh, age-driven defect. And so again, we are continuing to pursue uh, this interplay. How do you model stresses um, uh, with, you know, and age-related age um, cofactors here with the genetics, right? And so I think having sort of the right ways to model these things could be very helpful in uh, uh, identifying novel therapeutics. And so I, I'm going to stop here. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you about our, our basic science and, and the folks in my group um, have done all the work. I, I just speak about it. And I'll, I'll just stop now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Great talk.